Great Plays. As the last in the present series of Great Plays, the National Broadcasting Company presents Valley Forge by Maxwell Anderson. To attempt to condense this exceptional play into the space of an hour would rob it of much of its strength and beauty. Therefore, we have chosen to bring you several of the great scenes in their entirety, connecting them with a running narrative in order that the plot may be entirely clear. Scene one takes place in a bunkhouse at Valley Forge in January 1778. Built of logs, crudely furnished, it is a scene of indescribable privation. And the inhabitants, a group of Virginia riflemen, are cold, hungry, and practically without clothes. Their boots are worn out, socks are undreamed of, and many feet are on the floor. Spad, Minto, Teague, and his son Nick, Alcock, and Neil Bonniwell, the latter a young, handsome lad who is ill with fever, sit about on the bunks discussing desertion. They have been trying to eat what is left of the miserable food, but with no success. The door opens and Lieutenant Cutting comes in, followed by a bulldog, who goes at once to an untouched plate of food on the floor. Spad speaks. Well, where'd you come from, Pop? What dog's that? He came in with you, Lieutenant. Oh, the cur's been following me all the way from the King of Prussia's Inn. <laughs> you better avast from that mess, Pop. It'll poison you. Time to bunk in if you want any sleep, Alcock. You're all to be on parade at five for manual of arms and a baron von Steuben. After that, you'll spend the day making cartridges. Now, what good is a cartridge? Do you want to get yourself cashiered? Mm, I'll be glad to be cashiered and get my four months back pay. Hey, boy. What regiment's this? Who goes? You keep kind of an offhand guard here, soldier. You must know it's Lieutenant Colonel Lucifer Tent, and I ask you a question. First Virginia. Good. Well, I didn't know whether that was a sentry you had out there or a prehistoric animal. He's standing with his feet in his hat and a blanket over his ears, making no sense whatever. Sit down, sit down. Put your feet in your hats if that's the latest fashion. Well, we've lost a couple of sentries with frostbite this month, Colonel. The boy's shoes are none too good. I'm sorry to hear it, Mason, because I'm looking for a squad with passable footwear. How many able-bodied men in your company, Lieutenant? Seventy-two this morning. How many with guns, shoes, and equipment for a little stroll across the country in the snow? Twenty-eight or thereabouts. Twenty-nine. I'm going if I go in my shirt tails. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. It'll have to do. Look alive, you fellas. This is a raid on the Hay Islands below Derby under the personal supervision of the Commander-in-Chief. When are we supposed to start? Tonight. We must be there by three in the morning. Draw four days' rations for each man. We may be gone sometime. We don't start tonight, though. Sir? Not tonight, sir. You heard the order, I believe? With my compliments, sir. It happens. The thing's impossible. We've drawn the last ration for this regiment, such as it was. If that dog keeps it on his stomach... He'll probably go to meet his makeup before morning. The supplies for your regiment were sufficient for ten more days. On paper, yes. But when they rolled out the last twenty barrels, the meat was spoiled. As for the flour, they baked the remains of it this morning. It appears to me you enjoy this situation. Not at all. Nor am I to blame for it. The blame, I believe, attaches elsewhere. Do you wish to say where? I have said before, and I say it again. That this is probably the worst managed army in the history of military operations. Yes, I've heard you. And I say mismanaged by whom? When I served abroad, there was never any doubt where the management of an army lay. Might be as well if you informed yourself on that head. It's a very little moment what you wish to say about me, Mr. Cutting. But there are certain names I don't care to hear insulted. I insult nobody. Let me judge of that for myself. General Washington wishes to know if this matter is arranged, Colonel. Will you, you say to General, General Wayne? Wayne? I'll be glad if he could step in here for a moment. Yes, sir. Wait, I'll tell him myself. Oh. Yeah. They rolled out the last barrel this morning. Did you hear what he said? What did I tell you? I heard plenty. Listen, boys, there may be some stuff coming. They had stuff coming for the last three weeks, and it hasn't come yet. Wait a moment. Wait a moment. Lieutenant. Yes, sir? The food train has begun to arrive. You will riddle your expedition at once. Yes, sir. Is this the train that was sent on from Fishkill by General Putnam, sir? It is. Though how you came to hear of it, I'm at a loss to conceive. I supped this evening with General Conway, who had received a letter from Putnam. And if the information in the letter is correct... I very much fear you will be disappointed. Putnam was unable to locate mules or wagons to accommodate the food allotment. Unable? Completely unable, as he said. You have information that the food was not sent? So it would seem. When did the letter arrive? I believe yesterday. Can there be truth in this? As a matter of fact, the bills of lading failed to cover the food supplies, but I suppose them in error. I should like to hope so. But I've had some experience with commissary departments. 
It sticks in my crop a little, let me add, that I should receive important intelligence in a manner so singularly circuitous. Sir, I hope I have not offended. Not in the least, sir. I'm in your debt for the information. And can only congratulate you and General Conway on the celerity with which you received dispatches which have not been both saved to your commander-in-chief. The expedition will be postponed. We're assigned to some other company better prepared to move. Meanwhile, food must be obtained for this regiment. We have to cut stakes off the members of the Board of War. They're all prime, I've noticed. General, would you care to know whose dog this is? Monsieur de Lafayette, we're in haste. Yes, but the inscription on this collar reads, Rover Sir William Howe. <laughs> this rover has roved all the way from Philadelphia. It's General Howe's dog. I was planning to skin him. Now I'll eat him. I might have known by the fat on his ribs he was no local product. We must see that he's returned. Have you pen and ink here? Yes, sir. Lucifer. Sir William Howe, British Headquarters, Philadelphia. Sir, the bearer of this note will return to you a dog of which you appear to be the owner. May I add, I was the more astonished to find him at Valley Forge since I supposed the desertions to be going the other way. Send a reliable man with a flag to Philadelphia. The animal is to be delivered to the general himself with this note. My compliments. Uh, this is a man I know. Would the errand amuse you? I'm easy to amuse, General, but the fact is I haven't any britches. Well, that can hardly be considered a defective character. I'd like to carry the note, sir. If it's agreeable with your lieutenant. Certainly. General Washington. Now, oh. quiet, you fool. Yeah, what is it? These here new regulations about men going home. Going home without leave. They say it's 75 lashes if they catch you now. Why is that? The traditional penalty for desertion is shooting at sunrise. We've been more lenient here. But look, General Washington, it doesn't make sense. Why, it don't stand to reason that we... You want to talk your neck into a rope? Let him say what's on his mind. Well, here it is. I'm going hungry here, and my woman is going hungry at home. Now, you let me go home for the winter, and you won't have to feed me. And that relieves the commissary. I rustle some wild meat for the young ones and the old woman. And they don't starve, and I don't starve. Oh, I don't hold it against you... And I don't hold it against anybody, because I don't know who in thunder to hold it against. But there's nothing to eat here. Show it, will you? No, it ain't that I'm afraid of a good fight. Ah, oh, me and my boy here, we make for home every winter when the grub gets scarce. And we come back every spring when the fighting starts. What's your name, sir? Teague, sir. Teague is my name. Well, Master Teague, if they catch you, they'll give you 75 lashes. And that's a good deal to take and live. On the other hand, from your own point of view, you're quite right. If I were in your position, I should feel as you do. But this you should know, sir. If you go home and we all go home this winter, you won't need to bother about coming back in the spring. There'll be no fighting to come back to. General Howe will march out of Philadelphia and take over these states of ours. If he knew now how many have deserted, how many are sick, how many are unfit for duty on account of the lack of food and clothes and munitions... He'd come out in force and wring our necks one by one and the neck of our sickly little revolution along with us. So far, we've kept him pinned in Philadelphia by sheer bluster and bluff and show of arms. He thinks there's still an army here. What are we in this war for? Are we tired of it? Do we want to quit? No. 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 I can't blame you if you sound a bit half-hearted about it. Oh, I ain't half-hearted about it. Not me. I'm fighting to keep King George out of my backyard. I moved west three times to get rid of his damn tax collectors. And every time they caught up with me. I'm sick of tax collectors. That's why I'm in it. Then it may be you're here in error. And the sooner you discover it, the better. You'll get death and taxes under one government as well as another. But I'll tell you why I'm here. And why this is no lucky war for me. I thought it was at first. I wanted to astound the world as a military leader. But my head's grayer now, and I've had enough of that. What I fight for now is a dream. A mirage, perhaps. Something that's never existed on this earth, and never will exist. Unless we can make it and put it here. The right of free-born men to govern themselves in their own way. Now, men are mostly fools, as you're well aware. They'll govern themselves like fools. There are more fools to the square inch in the Continental Congress than in the Continental Army, and the percentage runs high in both. So far, our government's as rotten as the sow belly it sends us. I hope and pray it will get better. 
But whether it gets better or worse, it's your own, by God. And you can do what you please with it. And what I fight for is your right to do what you please with your government and with yourselves, without benefit of kings. It's for you to decide, Master Teague, you and your son and the rest of you. This is your fight more than mine. I don't know how long the Congress means to keep me where I am, nor how long you mean to stay with me. If you desert, they may catch you and they may not. Whether you go or stay, you must make your own decisions. But if we lose you, if you've lost interest in this cause of yours, then we've lost our war, lost it completely. And the men we've left on our battlefields have died for nothing, for a dream that came too early and may never come true. We mark time here, gentlemen. There is much to do. Hench! I'll follow in a moment, sir. Well, I guess the old woman will get along all right. She's brought in her own bear meat before. Well, it's, it's all right with me. And now, if you don't mind cutting, we'll finish that conversation of ours. Fire when ready. It just occurred to me that that dog had General Howe's name on his neck. Huh? And it may not be an accident that he's following you around. Now, by God, you'll fight. That's my intention. If you mean I've been colleaguing with General Howe and the English, I'll tamp that light on your throat and I'll do it now. I don't know whether you have or not. But I say it's fitting and proper that Howe's dog came in at your heel. Gentlemen, Sir. gentlemen. Before you lay charges of treason against me in this offhand manner, let me assure you there's no great mystery about the dog's appearance in our lines. An exchange of prisoners took place at General Conway's headquarters this evening, and the cur may have followed the British party into camp. I'm no friend of the English, but if they win, it'll be because of you and those who side with you in your fanatic devotion to a gentleman whose leadership was long ago discredited. Meaning General Washington. Naming who you will. Name your new leader, then. I, you name him. I have no fancy for laying myself liable to court-martial. It's as open as that, then. As open to satisfaction, if that's what you mean. And you're all as well aware of it as I am. Why doesn't Arnold hold a commission, huh? Why are Lee and Gates shunted into the Northern Department? Why is Conway pensioned off with minor commands? I thought we'd come to Why? Conway. Why? Because the army's run for the glory of a little inner clique, of which you happen to be one. And you wanted run for a little clique of adventurers that served in every army in Europe, sworn allegiance to every king and cause in Christendom, and turned your coat so often for money that every time you see a shilling, you start undressing. You've served abroad, I believe. I know a man when I see one. Washington's a man. And there isn't one among those you've named that he couldn't eat after dinner with a little brandy and soda to wash down the taste. I'd take the trouble to quarrel with you if I thought it worth my while, but it isn't. You can rate Conway and Lee and Gates as low as you like. They'll hold their commissions long after your Washington's gone back to planting tobacco along the Potomac. He's a beaten man. You heard this speech? If that wasn't a valedictory, I never heard one. He's tired, and the others are tired of him. And when he goes, you'll go with him. Come, come, this is news. When may we expect this happy sequel? I've said my say. You have indeed, and you've said what I wanted to get out of you. No doubt you're a talebearer too, to go with the rest of your colonial virtues. You may be right. Tell it then. I've said nothing that isn't said from here to Boston, and with that it flourishes. Good night, sir. Gentlemen... Your pardon for a scene that hardly calculated to instill respect and discipline. Good night. You starting now, Spad? Yeah. You watch me. If I fetch his dog back to him, the least Sir William can give me is a square meal. And if I time it right, I'll have beef and kidney pie tomorrow night for supper. I hope you overeat yourself. Thanks. Always a friend. <coughs> Lie still, Neil. Lie still. Rest. I'll have a long time to rest. It's snowing again. We'll see nothing but snow till spring. Tell me, somebody. Am I going to live through till it's green again? Why, sure, sure, boy. No, I, I guess not. Well, I want to ask you one thing. The next time you get ordered out, no matter what it's for, take me along. Will you do that? Because I came here to fight for something. Because I believed in something. Take me along and let me die that way. Because... This is a poor death to die. The scene changes now to General Howe's headquarters in Philadelphia. A party is in progress. In strong contrast to Valley Forge, all here is laughter and gaiety and good living. At curtain, Sir William and his guest, Mary Phillips, are talking. Night fleeted silkish music is in the weed. It's silken music. Silk and sad music. Yes, sad too. These artists, they know so well how to interweave love and death. 
in tapestries, mute, lovers, battles. There's nothing to break the heart like these same minuets we used to dance to. You should have loved a soldier, dear lady. I married a soldier? Yes, his name. Oh, is that to the purpose to inquire names? My dear, if I knew his name, I'd be inclined to practice King David's stratagem. Poor man. I'd set him in the forefront of the battle, and then his widow, I'd keep her for my struggle. Oh, you mistake me. But you're forgiven for being misled. In faith, I asked to meet you, and I'm not angry. But truly, I'm sad this evening for love of someone else. Oh, does it all? Why not for love of me? Oh, it just happens this once. You're not the man. Someone outshines me in my own camp? Darkness and death and devils shall this be born. But tell me his name and place, and you shall have him. He's not at your disposal, Sir William. He serves elsewhere. No, in real truth, he serves on the other side. And what I wanted was leave to go out and see him. Insult on insult. Not only a less than I am, an enemy. Sweet lady, how you humble me, my pride. But you shall have him. Only another rebel, dear lady. God set up kings and all that prayer books teach us it's irreligious to fight against them. Now, come be serious. With a woman? Solemn, then sad, doleful. I loved and lost when I was a child. I let my love go then, when I might have had him. And now it may be too late. See the tears in my eyes. You have smitten the rock like Moses. When I was a child, a young man came wooing from Virginia way, and we fell in love. But my parents said, no, no, this is an Indian fighter. You are rich and may turn out good looking. Let him go and catch yourself a lord. And I let him go and caught myself a captain in the Marines, or something of that kind. I've never loved him. I wanted what I lost. The Indian fighter? Yes. <laughs> Someone I know? I doubt you've seen him, but you've heard of him. He's no less on the rebel side than you on this. Washington? I believe that was the name. Is this some game you play? Oh, it would be but a poor game. No, I'm deadly earnest. I, I'm not jesting now. What a strange, mad thing is a woman's heart. And you go to him... And give up all that's civilized to live on cornbread in a log cabin? Sir, you don't know him. We've danced many a minuet together and tasted wine from France. There was no cornbread in his upbringing. And will it be so long before we come to terms with the rebels? This is the last year of their war. A long-headed girl. You thought this through. I hope so. But then I've heard the man is married, is he not? A widow. When I refused him, he married a window, widow with land and a nest of children. Nasty ones, I hope, with wipey noses. <laughs> Is there any other kind? Will you tell me why it should seem to you, after so many years, that you must see him now? If he's defeated, will you see defeat's a dull and lonely thing. And I might bring some heart ease out of the past to make it easier. The war will be over soon and he'll go back to Virginia. I to a house I never cared to live in. Must come now, or never come at all. And yet, my dear, the answer's no. As a gallant to a lady, we may talk, look you, of anything under heaven. But wars are something which you've hardly imagined here in this ballroom. They're fought with blood and iron. I say for your sake, for yours alone, you're not to cross the lines. I understand that. If you refuse, why, then you must refuse. You have your reasons. Still, I shall go. Without a pass? If necessary. There comes a time when a woman's desperate to have her youth. It's come to me and I'll have it, though all the generals in hell should stand eyes front and bar my passage. Oh, believe me, I can make my way. And being warned, I shall find a way to prevent it. And so, good night. During the course of the evening, Spad has returned the dog to General Howe. Knocked down a soldier who was impersonating General Washington in an impromptu play and has started back to the American lines. Major Andre is passing through the room as Sir William calls him. Major Andre, if you will remain a moment. Sir, at your service. That lady is your guest, sir, I believe. Yes, General. Mistress Morris, an old friend and my guest this evening. You can vouch for her loyalty, no doubt? Why, with my life or anything you ask. I've heard bad news tonight. Bad news? The French alliance, which we fear is imminent or likely. Mm, that's bad enough. If I could reach Washington before this news gets to him, I might just... Could you see how the lady was offended at the masquerade? Yes, sir. Then perhaps I have an expedient. Bring her to me. Will you tell her of the French alliance? No. I think we'd best lie to the lady on that one score. You wish to see me, sir? 
I've been revolving the request you made, dear lady, and thinking we might let you go after all. Here is a note which I have just received from General Washington. If you should see him, would you take him a message from me? He's not without a sense of humour. And your message? Something about a dog? No, I want your help. I want this war to end. It was useless and hopeless, God knows, from the beginning. And tonight, we've learned one fact that makes it perfect suicide for the colonies to continue. The French alliance. Well, there's to be none. You've learned this? It's quite certain. And now, what hopes have they? None. None at all. This Washington of yours, he's a Virginia squire at heart. He likes to take his ease and hunt his foxes. If I had half an hour to talk things over with him, I'd have him on my side and there'd be no revolution. But is he open to reason? He's a canny gentleman. He knows how bread is buttered. Then he will talk with you? Well, that was where I thought you might come in, Mistress Morris. You say you loved him once and you wish to see him. Well, that can be dished up into some raggle-taggle gypsy tale all honey and moonlight. How you sheer must, must see him. If no man's brain can find the seasoning, but you worm your way into a friendly meeting... Sir, I've no wish to face him as a bearer of bad news. I loved him deeply once. And still do. Find another courier who has more heart for this errand. This is not bad news. It's a rescue from despair. What I offer him is peace with honour. One word from him and we all forget and forgive. Exchange general pardons. Live again like men. I'm a liberal myself. Want to see men free as he does. But good Lord, when has a king balked freedom? When has the lack of a king guaranteed it? I can't write this to him. That would be treason. But you could tell him for me. But if I told him this, it must be rescue indeed. And he must know it. And you must mean it, Sir William. I do mean it. I mean it from my heart. You'll think because I dance and take it lightly and play about with women, this damned war means nothing to me but a colonial interlude, a picnic on military lines. I tell you and swear it, if I could keep some semblance of victory, they could have their liberty for all of me. Three years is much too much to give a cause you never believed in. I shall take this message. We'll get this soldiering over and do it quickly if I can be of help. Think of it as accomplished, for indeed it will be. Now I run one danger. We may lose you to the rebels. Oh, sir, I had supposed the desertions to be going the other way. Back now to Valley Forge. The scene is Washington's headquarters. With Washington are Generals Barnum, Sterling, Colonel Tench, and Lafayette. Washington speaks. General Barnum, I hear you bring pointed news. Well, I'd rather have it from someone I can trust than three knifers in the dark. Sir, <clears throat> I'm here under protest and come reluctantly. I've been made the spokesman for an officer's conference which you neither called nor attended. Man, no apologies came to some conclusion this conference? Sterling was there. He could tell you what better. You were chosen to speak, not I. The officers wish me to tell you that it's, that it's reckless to ignore their demands for adequate provision. Men must eat if they're to live. And we must feed them or lose them all. We've lost nigh half our army already. The rest cling by a ragged edge. It's not I that say this. I speak for the officers. And if you spoke for yourself? Uh, I am a soldier. If I were in command of the Continental Army, I'd say now that we can't go on. But I'm not in command. I'm a soldier. I take orders. What orders you give, may there be men left to follow. As for these officers, there's little I can say to them at the moment, for I'm empty-handed. Moreover, it's not accident, as you may have thought, that you men are here tonight. Is the revolution over, or is it worth trying to hold on into spring, when at least there's food to be had? It may cost lives by hundreds, perhaps by thousands. What it means to me to say this, I think you know. General Varnum has spoken. Sterling, what do you say? There are some men here who'd see it through with you if you give the word till they've eaten the wolves. Extinct. Enough, you think, to hold the English till spring? No, but there would be enough. Now, here I bring up a sore subject and one perhaps there's no place for in this conference. But there'd be enough and then to spare if those moth-eaten drones who've served abroad and spread their dog-eared commissions in every company to prove they've been in a war... Let's stay with our subject. There are many with us who served in England and France and in Germany too before this war. Some of irreplaceable value. And some who'd sell the cannon out of Valley Forge for three Spanish dollars paper. 
They'd sell you out to Gates or Lee or any mother's son who'd raise their rank for half a crown a year. Well, we have no evidence of it. No evidence? Take out some time for this. Three nights ago, I was drunk with a certain American general who serves here in this valley. He was drunk, too. And he boasted to me how he'd written to General Gates and to members of Congress that in his ripest judgment, this war was lost unless you, Washington, were superseded. Who was this? Who? Why, Conway. He's a dirty traitor, and there's plenty like him. That's talk in his cup. You think so? It sobered me fast enough. When you find such a letter, it will be time enough. So I thought when I was sober. And so thinking, I saddled a horse and rode me 60 miles till I caught the post that carried that letter and took it from him in a habit. And there, with your leave, it is. What does it say? What he boasted of and more. I shall see, Conway. And while you're about it, see Lieutenant Cutting, who runs his errands for him. And let me witness what he said to me of the same. We can take both later. At this moment, who shall be the head of this phantom army is a question almost academic. In a republic, treason is not exactly what it seems under a king. We have rights of opinion here. Friend Gates has been winning victories of late. It may be he'd be better. Now, if you meant that... I don't, as it happens. This Conway's three-quarter snake. You'll see him squirm in a griddle. Thank God for that. A man can be overpatient. I've asked your counsel on another point, sir. Not that. And you want it now? We're ready for it now. Then it's Congress that stands in our way. You know yourself. They'll come tomorrow. Look us over. Then go back to their horse trading. And I'd see the Congress damned before I'd let them ruin our campaign for us. This country would come to you with open arms if you said to them once and for all, I'll take just this and that, and I'll take it now when it's needed. One word. One breath from you and you'd blow the Congress from here to Maine. Are you proposing I make myself dictator? Why are you so afraid of words? It's that or lose. Has it escaped you, sir, that we fight this war against usurpation of power? Should I usurp the powers of Congress, which gave me what power I have, I'd have nothing left to fight for. I beg your pardon. We're in rebellion against the King of England, or so I thought. It happens that our Congress is the heart of what we fight for, good or bad, and I uphold it. Now, keeping that in mind, is it possible to go on? No, sir, it is not. Last night there was mutiny in the 18th. You know that as well as I do. They objected to their food and little blame to them. This will happen again and spread. There's no holding men to discipline when there's bread in the country and boots and bales of clothing waiting for shipment and nothing but plain fools sitting in the legislature with holes in them. Who gives a simple curse for Congress or theories when his guts are rotted out with rotten food and his toes falling off from freezing? I'm not a pious man. I'm a soldier, as Varnum says he is. And a soldier's business is to fight when he has to, run away when he can, eat when he can get it, drink and stay alive. I'll fight for the man I believe in, and that's you, sir. But if I'm to fight to make Congress permanent, they can take their revolution and stick it back in the bung it came from. But wait, my gentle Lucifer. There's treason enough without our adding to it. Well, if I speak treason, make the most of it. The whole war is treason to King George. It all depends on the point of view and whether you win. This is new. Well, I've read your letters to Congress, sir, and read their replies. And they've sickened me of our war for freedom. A dictatorship leads straight to monarchy. And monarchy is the thing we fight to rid ourselves of. Monsieur de Lafayette, I'm loath to speak, gentlemen, in this conference. I shall offend, I know. Being but a young man, alien, the sign of an old kingdom, ancien regime in word and manner. The more reason we should hear you. Let's have it, lad. Shall I begin by saying something you know but may have forgotten? This world you have cut from a wilderness is a new world, brighter with sun and summer, colder with winter cold than the world I knew. The air is strange, sharp. The voice rings here with a hard ring. I find no man but looks you in the eye and says his thought in your teeth and means it. This was not known before on the star we inhabit. Europe has 30 kings and 100 million slaves. But here in this land, each man is a king and walks like a king. Each woman bears herself regally like a queen. It's not in you to bow nor to speak humbly. It's a trick you've never learned and cannot learn in this air. As for these thrones that men have bowed to, I've come from them lately and seen them, how they're eaten down with old vices and slimed with worms until they crumble into the moats. Lower your muscles. Droop your flags. Even so, the kingdoms falter and go down of themselves. And a very pleasant thought, too. You must forgive me. I have an unfortunate eloquence which betrays me when I launch on this theme. No, no, no. I meant that comment. I shall curb it if I can, however, and save you from the longer. But one fact I must state before I end. We have set ourselves to send you men, money, and ships. Our little king may scream and cling to his velvet furniture and stamp on his powdered wig. Still, 
He's dragged along with my own party, and before the end of spring, you will have these men, money, and ships. The end of spring? Oh, you cannot wait. I know it. Not possibly. Yet, if you knew what dreams and faith rest on you, you would do this impossible. I'm a young noble, rich, spoiled, and perhaps not wise. I'm 20 years old, and I left a child wife in France whom I love. I came because the best life in all this world lives here, in what you have to do. I've, I've slipped again into rhapsody, and again you must forgive me since I meant each word. You're quite forgiven. Yes. But the question's not what we want to do, but what we can. How much have we on hand? Oh, we might scrape up by equalizing three or four days' provision for every corps. I wouldn't want to eat it, and neither would you, sir. When we come to the end of that, God help us. Gentlemen, why don't you spit it out and say forthright what you mean? It's your belief we have no chance, and that's what you want to say. Have I said it for you? True enough. Yes, sir. Then I thank you for being honest. We have food for three days. We gamble our three days on a change of luck and risk what brand of hell's reserved for madmen. The order's given. Take back that word to the officers. All commanders meet here at five in the morning. Very well, sir. Good night, sir. I'll face these commissioners with you, sir. Thanks, Sterling. Good night. Good night, sir. Ready, Barnum? Ready. There was something you said that moved me strangely. You left a young wife in France. Does she mean so little to you? Little? My friend. And yet, loving her so, you left her? It's a poor love that belittles whom it loves. Or would hold him back from what's best and highest. If I wished to come, she would have me come. You'll find few like her. None. None, I should think. Your fortune in a wife has been our good fortune. You fall across our night like a young star, all aflame. Let us hope you're destined to avoid our quenching. Sir, the sun's quenched in ocean and rises in the morning. I gauge my life it will be so with you. Oh, I'll rise in the morning if that's what you mean. Damn these females. Yes, Lucifer? There's an officer left over in the exchange of prisoners. A British major or wears that uniform. But it's plain to be seen there's a woman inside. A woman? Would seem hardly a problem for my attention. There's ladies on our hands. Escort's gone. She has to see Washington with a verbal message. How? She carries no papers? None, not a scrap. But I must say she looks the lady. There's been money spent on her breeding. Well, let her in if she comes from Howe. They say if one waits long enough, all things come round the circle. So I heard. And I waited. And suddenly it seemed too long to wait. We grow old, we mortals. At the risk of being ungallant, may I ask why you're here? I came to see you. And this costume? It's not becoming. Then I'll not wear it again. As to that, it's worn by my enemies. A woman's stratagem. Is a woman never to follow her heart and run after him she loves, though she run back 20 years? I'm afraid you mistake me. This war's hardly a game of blind man's buff. Nor am I a figure in grand opera with love affairs between battles. It goes grimly with me and mine. And although it's true you meant more than a heartbreak to me in my twenties, still what treasure may lie there lies too deep for dredging. Nor have I heart, nor hours, nor patience for nice romancing. I understand there's time in plenty for all this in the camp you've left and wonder at your leaving. There, I... I expected just this rebuff and have my answer ready. I'm not light, nor given to lightness, nor have I come here lightly. The one thing worth having in a brief life, I have still to seek. It was mine once for the taking. It came at your offering, and I tossed it away, believing like all young fools, it grew on every bush. But I'm not young now, and I'd risk whatever name the world might give me to have it back again. You come from how? would have caught at any junketing that brought me here. I came on chance. I asked for nothing. But I'm here. I shall seem ungracious. You married Captain Morris. And I am married. We're fixed in our two worlds. The time runs out for pleasantries. It's winter in my bones as well as in the year. Is this your baggage? I'm afraid it is. Uh, sir... I do bring you a word from General Howe, one that should be more welcome than I am. He proposes general amnesty and all goodwill again, nothing reserved save the king's sovereignty. 
Tell him we mean to fight while we can. We've asked complete independence. And still have hopes of it? And still have hopes. I can say to you truly there's no hope for you on the other side. If I have come unasked and unwelcome, still it can't be said I go with the wind. We have news today from Paris of the French Alliance. This is your losing year. I was willing to lose with you. And your news? The French will have none of us? Is that your message? So the story runs? And so I feared. We must take it in our stride if we can. I thank you. No doubt I've been abrupt beyond all warrant. Forgive me. I carry a good many burdens. I think no less of you. I'm sorry for us both. To be quite frank, you lose no lover in me. I'm old and cold and given over to soldiering. What love I have is given. A young man has excess of appetite and eats at every table. When we're older, the body fires less easily. It waits permission of the mind and memory. And these come seldom. For you and me, I'm sad to think we must grow too coldly and make an end to love. It may be so. And now if you'll call the soldier. Yes. Sentry, this lady will occupy Hamilton's room. And good night. Good night. The scene changes to the bunkhouse again. On his way back from Howe's headquarters, Spad has discovered a cache of corn on an hay island. He tells the men about it, and they decide to leave at once to capture it. Just as they reach the door, Cutting enters. What's going on here? Why, uh, why, get, getting ready for a roll call, sir. Yeah. Looks to me like an unwanted stir of activity for this hour. Where's Alcock? Well, he was, he was here a minute ago. Find him. And report on the parade ground in half an hour. The two squads of the ablest men for morning drills. There's no breakfast issued yet, sir. We're on short rations, and most of the regiment's doing without breakfast this morning. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't take the responsibility, Lieutenant. You can't? No, sir. And why not? I don't know whether they'd follow me. What's in the wind here? I want to serve notice about one thing. There are no two ways to run an army. I'll have absolute obedience, or I'll see a few of you underground. I think I understand this early rising. There's been a good deal of desertion in the past few days. Personally, I don't give a hoot whether you desert or not. But officially, I do. I'm going to keep my military record clean. And while I'm officer here, I'll put a bullet through anybody who attempts to leave camp without permission. Put down your guns. And just to make certain, I'll go with you when drill time comes. Now, Mason, I ask you again. What's going on here? We were just stepping out for breakfast, that's all. I thought so. Well, sit down and take it easy. Nobody's stepping out anywhere. Don't do anything sudden, Mr. Cutting. Because I'm a nervous man. And liable to spasms in my trigger finger. Huh? If you draw that pistol, I'll put a slug through your pump. And I never missed yet. What is here, Iron? Put down that gun. Not me. Back over against that wall. Step. <laughs> Take your hand off that butt. Take that pea shooter away from him. They'll stretch your necks for this, you know. And I'll have the watching of it. Don't say things like that. Because I never did like you. And I feel one of my spasms coming on. What shall I do with him, Corporal? Tie him up. Right off. You'll not tie me with your damn dollar shreds. Stop! I'll see you all lash the shreds, you scabby hounds. Yeah, you won't see us again. You nor none of you. We're through with this damn camp and your orders. Lieutenant Cutting's wanted headquarters at 9 o'clock. Well, he'll probably work himself loose by that time. What's up? Uh, grab your stuff, boys. We're going. Where? We're invited out to eat. Get going, Mookies. Come on, boys. You're in on this. Neil. Get up and untie me. <laughs> you hear me? Back now to Washington's headquarters. Two delegates from Congress are expected, Messrs. Folsom and Harvey. With grim humor, Washington serves them some of the army food. In the midst of their disgust, General Conway and Lieutenant Cutting are brought in to be questioned by Washington. Letters have been intercepted proving that Conway has been in communication with General Gates without Washington's knowledge. General Washington decides to hold both for court-martial when Conway speaks. I give fair warning. If I'm court-martialed, I have three words to speak that'll hush it up. Speak them now. 
Believe me, sir, there's more consequences in what you plan than is plain on the surface. What consequence? I say no more. Then we proceed. Will you speak up for me, or must I speak for myself? Why, these two knew as well as I the correspondence with Howe, and most of the Congress knew it. If I'm a traitor, they're traitors with me. We were commissioned by Congress to angle for Howe's terms. Well, look at me if you like. Does this surprise you? When a war is lost, the usual thing is to feel around for bargains. And that's what's being done. What he says is true. It has not yet been brought to a vote in Congress, nor did we wish it published. But this is true. There are those among us who know that a war is worth what it brings on the exchange, no more. And when your stock is going down, it's best to sell it before it goes to nothing. What's that? What's that? Why, I'll say it again. A war, my friend, is a tactical expedient to gain certain political ends. Those ends being proved impossible, the war's without excuse. And should be pushed no further than need be to gain an advantageous peace. You say it, and I must believe you've said it. But death of God, is this like any other war? The same, or much the same? Sir, I should have supposed you'd notify me before negotiations were begun with the enemy. There was thought of it. But you and your army have so much of the hothead in your composition, it was believed unwise to open the subject. Besides, there was always doubt what reply we'd get from the British. And it seemed best not to call off our dogs till we were sure we had no more need for them. Your dogs, you say? Nay, nay, that's a figure. Not one I'm inclined to relish. When did this begin? Some months ago, when you lost at Brandywine that cooked our goose. Then Gates at Saratoga made a good talking point in case Sir William was hard to deal with. But we might have won. Good God, do you hear what I say? Have they fudged our cause on purpose? That's the way it sounds. Oh, no, no. Then why this pother over Conway and Gates? If we're to lose the war, why not let me lose it? It's hardly like them to relieve me of that out of kindness. I see no reason for keeping you in the dark. Gates is in our councils and quite agrees that we might as well give in while there's still trade on the seas. Wait now, wait now. You're putting in Gates because he's agreed to surrender. Is that what you mean to say? It's ruinous to drag it out further. And who's agreed to this? There's no agreement. Yes, but that was his meaning. Who's in it with you? I have no mind to be pummeled for answering a question. Answer your own. Sterling, yes, Ruffy. Uh, no more. It's unfortunate this much has slipped. It's open as the world. As for these professional soldiers who get the bit in their teeth and insist on fighting till it's high water in hell, perhaps they'll learn sometime it's no treason for a government to consider a peace, even in wartime. No more. Why not? If he wants his answer, I'll give it to him. This war began to protect our trade. The merchants were being run out of business by subsidies to English boats. It cut so deep in Boston that there was no more profit in smuggling. And all our trade was smuggling anyway. They dumped the tea in Boston Harbor and raised a hue and cry of freedom down with a tyrant. What they wanted was profits, not freedom. But then the inland boys took up the yell and ran together in mobs. And old Sam Adams made speeches and cock a hoop pell mell. It spread till we couldn't stop. Spread to Virginia. And a pack of oyster faced backwoodsmen met and signed a declaration. And then we were in trouble. Where's our trade now? Nobody makes money, not even the money lenders. Nobody but the farmers selling pork to the British commissary. It's time to stop it. We've got to settle down and live, that's all. And why not under King George? If your fire eaters can't make a living in time of peace, why well, the rest can't make one now. This sentiment prevails in Congress. It does or it will shortly. And this is the reason supplies have been withheld? I should say there's been little stomach for expenditures that looked to a longer war when peace was in the air. I understand you. Nobody cared to win. What was there to win? We lose more day by day than we'll ever gain back. Perhaps we've been unaccustomed to thinking in terms of money of some things men give their lives for. You may find this difficult to comprehend. You who have thought beyond us and reckon our lives in dollars. Oh, but that's not so. Harvey forgets himself and says too much and outruns all discretion. I think we know how to estimate you both. I shall hope no more for any help from you. Make your appointments. Make any arrangements you like. You need not consult with me. Well, I'm sorry indeed for the turn we've taken, for uh, we had meant to offer our full cooperation. Had you so? <laughs> Sir, is your report of Congress like your friend's, or is he in error? <clears throat> Truly, there's a, there's a trend toward peace. <laughs> if only for business reasons. Then we've heard enough. And this court martial that seemed to be in the wind, is that to go on? I beg your pardon, Conway. There'll be no court martial. 
No, no for cutting. Thank you. It appears the desire to degrade me and put Gates in my place so that he might surrender was patriotic and quite in a fashion. I wish you a very good day, you and the honorables from Congress also. May they find good fare on the road. Whatever plans you have for ending the war in a gradual way, you may put aside. I'll end the war for you and do it quickly. You'll take no steps in that without instruction. No. You exceed your power if you do. Only the Congress may move in that, as you're aware. And we have taken orders from you. Try to find some patriotic purpose in your ships and denials. You thing of lace. What? You essence of Judas. Come, sir, this is raving. And you, back a minute. The Congress stands behind him in this betrayal. The Congress may change its mind. It has that right. You'll find the army, too, has rights that I'll defend. You want the war ended? We'll end it, then. But in our own fashion and on our own terms. So William shall hear from me, but behind your backs this time. I warn you, sir. Take no steps without instruction. Your service here is under commission from our Continental Congress. Remember it. You'll take steps without instruction and take them now. Why, you... you Farmer, unhand me. What's this? What's this, sir? Will you lose all your friends? Well, that's a good beginning anyway. I wanted to do that, but you called me off. Well, that puts a period. Well, they've done their worst. Leave no fear from them. I've overstayed my time. I'll be late to the rendezvous. It's as I told you. Catch me fighting or dying for things like those. Why should you take it to heart? All a soldier gets is his pay and his leave and whatever girls he can catch with a uniform and never see again. There's nothing in it for you. Let them have their war. Yes, let them have it. Well, I'll be on my way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I disturbed you. I wish to thank you for your kindly entertainment at a time when you felt less reminiscent than the lady who knocked upon your door. I honor you and the men you lead. Let me say this in saying farewell. More than I'd thought possible. Yeah. But it seems that you were right. No, I was not. Yes. I've been a gull. They've led me in a ring like a circus bear to fight the children for them. Behind my back, they make shabby deals. But in a way, we fought no longer than they intended. And they lose money, hard money. They starve us out to make a stop. Two or three hundred tons of human beeves pushed out into the dark to teach us they lose money and can't afford it. So many crows over a stinking sheep in a bog cow yard would show more nobility. But I'm sure you're wrong. Disheartened over some check... Return to Howe. Tell him he can buy our Congress for tuppence less if he lays out his money shrewdly. I shall tell him no such thing, but that you're brave men, honest and dangerous... Yes, more than he thinks. The revolution sold out. Congress bargains behind my back, asks terms. Bargains with how? What's left of the revolution you see here? In these windy shacks and starved men. And broken boots I wear. What hopes we had of the French? You dashed them for me. Then this is the end of the war. This is the end. But before this quarrel goes out of my hands... I'll make my own bargain with Howe. That satisfaction I intend to have. When you see His Excellency, tell him from me that the conference with him, to which you bore invitation, waits only on his presence. Let him name his hour and place in fairly neutral territory. I'll meet him and thank you for the message. There's your passport. I came here hoping for this surrender, and yet, of all men I've known, I least like to think of you defeated. Defeat seems not for you, even a hopeless quarrel. It's not you that lose. Even now you are a king in yourself, unbeaten. I've given myself to a footless insurrection, poured out my blood on a mock heroic altar, made a monk of what might have been a man. And I'll get for that what Jack Keed got. Three lines in a history, touching a minor figure in a brief uprising that died down early in some year of our Lord A.D. God quit the picker. What will you do now? Live again, my dear. Begin to fence my land where I left it. Looking back, I'd say I've kept too many rules, laced too straight for comfort. But I'll drain at least what wine's left in the bottle before I throw it away. No. As I've loved you, I see truer than you. I know your destiny, and it's not these things you say. There are some men who lift the age they inhabit till all men walk on higher ground in that lifetime. God keep you and bring you victory. Dear lady, this nation spending its last heart's blood for a packet of liberty. We opened the packet today 
and it was empty. We ride on our last expedition. And so, goodbye. We come now to the final scene of Valley Forge. It takes place in a barn on Hay Island. By a strange coincidence, this barn is not only the spot chosen by Howe and Washington to discuss peace, but has also become a hideout for Spad, Teague, Nick, and Alcock in their raid on the corn stores. They have moved most of it, but Alcock and Nick have been wounded and are lying in piles of hay. Colonel Tench also happened along on a foray of his own and has gone to help those still at the corn cribs. As the scene opens, General Washington, Lafayette, and Sterling enter. Is this the place? It's where they pointed out, sir. I thought Tench had preceded us. He was here, General, but he stepped out to mix in the shindy. Sir, it seems to me there's something remarkably familiar, and yet remarkably strange about this place. I've seen these faces before. Yes, sir. In the bunkhouse at Valley Forge. Oh, true. I read you a long and I judge rather distasteful sermon on the evils of desertion. Like most good advice, it went unheeded. What do you expect a man to do? No charges will be brought against you. You may consider yourselves free of all further obligations to the Continental Army. But your presence here is damnably inconvenient. I have appointed a meet here with a British officer for a discussion which will hardly concern you. It would mortify me somewhat to introduce him into an apartment overrun by renegade Continentals. Cutting's a renegade, if you ask me. Is there any other place we could go? No, sir. We could go back to the boats. The difficulty is that Howe's expected here. Wonder he's not here already. Would it be possible to move these men into the grain room yonder? I can be moved. In fact, if I'm a renegade, I'm glad to get out. Collect your men, then. Shut the door behind you. Consider yourselves under arrest until you're mustered out. Warn them, sir, sir. Well, sir, your report. We took the depot about three o'clock this morning with little loss. But the garrison was asleep. We found some arms, four or five barrels of powder, but no food. Food is gone. It's as if they knew what we needed and led us on. They do know what we need. Who's got a flask? I'll have a drink if nobody minds. Stay out, boys. Stay your stumps and set a watch since you're here. If we move this boy, I'm afraid it'll finish him. Would it dash you much if he should lie here? He's badly wounded. Uh, it won't take long. Let him stay there if you must. Keep an eye on him, Sterling. I will, sir. General, this uh, meeting with Howe, must we proceed with it? Do you think it's easy for me? They said it was rain on the roof. Rain. Rain and summer quiet. But it was heartbeat. Heartbeat in the silence. Lie quiet, lad. She said lie quiet, too. Who are they here? They've taken me prisoner. It's articles of war. You can die, but not be prisoner. Calm yourself, boy. I remember. They brought me here from the river and laid me here to die. You must find a stone. Cut my name. My name was Neil. Or sometime. And say, underneath... The way it is on graves. He died of wounds. In battle. Yes, Neil. But put no date on the stone. Say, long ago, he died in a lost cause. And cut it deep. It's all I'll ever have. There's a light still. There. Shall we take him? Yes. Who goes? Out of my way. In, in regard to certain provender, which this squad of the First Virginia sacked last night from His Majesty's corn cribs, that Remy reported, reported stored at Copton's Landing. You'll find it there if you want it. As to the losses incurred in this action, there have been some wounded and some killed. How many, I don't know. But among the latter, Nick Teague and Lucifer Tench. Why, oh, I'm sorry, Teague. The boy slipped down between the piles. He, he was hurt. I, I couldn't reach him. Yes, sir. Do you list yourself among the slain? This is rather tasteless joking. I'm dead enough. My boots are full of blood. To die for hay and grain. Oh. <laughs> There's a high death for a swashing soldier. The devil damn your kings and congresses and their hay. Oh, keep your hand from me. I'll walk to where I lie. 
The dog dies best in a corner. Lucifer. No, I've had my day. It's time for another dog. <laughs> it's exit. Midnight. The last and a lack for Lucifer. Sir, I've loved you. But if you set your seal to an English compact, my curse on you. These dying men have visions. And that's the, the gist of mine. Come, bring on your burlap and your sailor's needle and sew me in to sleep. I'm tired and done. Tench, man. Tench! This was your son? No, sir. Nick was different from him. Nick was a boy you wouldn't see often. We carry a flag, friend. Ah, this is a peaceful errand. Yes, sir. They're waiting for you, sir. The English are outside, sir. Shall we call them in? No. Let them wait a moment. Tench is dead? Yes. General Washington, maybe you didn't get this just the way it was. I was going home, that's true. But I didn't go. Far from it. Sir, it's a very little moment what you've done with your time since I last saw you. I've told you... No charge will be brought against you. This war is ended. Yes, sir, we know that. Then what do you want with me? I was going home that time, but then you told me I'd better not. And we stayed. Didn't you mean that? I meant it then, but now you're free to go. Yes, sir. And clear this place. Look, when a man wants food, he has to get it. But we're not through fighting. It seems we're all through fighting. What's left to go home and farm your farms and sleep. And you can go. You've got no right to do it. Maybe we're not the kind of army you wanted. Because we don't keep drill. But don't you leave us now. And we won't starve either, and the army won't. Well, we stole Howe's corn last night, a thousand bushels, and ferried it over. Lost three men doing it. That ought to last a while. They won't rule any of us, nor any like us. We have to scatter and fight them. All right, we'll scatter. But we'll fight just the same. They'll get the cities and get Virginia, too, if you leave us. Yes, but we'll give them plenty of trouble. You see, if you stay, we can make a fight of it. But if you're gone, they'll drive us all out west. The amnesty provides full pardon. This war's not over yet. It won't be over till they plow us under, some of us. But we never thought you'd quit. That makes it tough. But what do you want? You want the war to go on? Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. God knows nobody else has seemed to want it. And you wouldn't if you knew what you asked. If I'd believed ten men out of our valley would follow me further, I'd not be here. But they left me like gnats in the wind. And you among them. We never left you. Yes. And who could follow me and look square at what's to come? There was a time when you had shoes on your feet and powder for your guns and fought to rule yourselves. There was hope in the air and possible victory. If you starved and died, you died for a purpose. Now that's gone. If you die now, you die for nothing. We have set our feet down hard on bedrock of despair. And I promise those who follow me further no hope of victory. No glory or gain or laurels returning home, but wounds and death, cold and disease and hunger. Winters to come such as this you have with your bloody trail in the snow, and no end to it till you shovel each other in with those at Valley Forge. Close in and take your places in my ranks if you like it. If you don't, and none will blame you, go your road as you have, find yourselves food, and live. I'll go with you. Yes, by God. That goes for all of us. We'll go with you. We'll, we'll fight, fight it out. Any way you say to go. Put me in, too. Now, they won't get us. Not while we can make our own powder. Well, there are men who would rather not live at all than not live free. We'll fight this war together. Call in, Sir William. We'll give him his answer. Right. Let them take their red coats back to London where they belong. They can leave the pants. We can use the pants. Come in, gentlemen. They're waiting for you. Sir William. At your service, General Washington. Sir, we are in your debt for a very fruitless errand. There will be no peace. On the terms now offered, it's useless to discuss it. The truce will end tonight. Aye, sir. They came here under the impression that our terms were acceptable. It's lately heard that certain backhanded measures were made toward you by members of the Congress. I came to you directly, as a soldier, to say there will be no peace. And no peace can be made effective without my word and that of the men I lead. I asked you for this meeting, not content to deal elsewhere. On what terms would a peace be considered? A complete withdrawal of His Majesty's troops and claims. That, I fear, you will find impossible. Make your peace with the Congress for what it's worth to you. Then come out and try to govern these hunters and backwoodsmen. 
Sir, I'm a servant to these men in their rags of homespun. They have heard your offer, and they reject it. Your choice of counsellors, sir, is your own, of course. But may I remind you that the people of the country are never open to reason in such matters. They're willing to fight for the virgin birth, or the freedom of the seas, or the tomb of Christ, when nobody knows where it is, or your brotherhood of man, or any drivel that's clean impossible. But tell them once what a war's really for, perhaps trade advantage, or the rights of bankers, and they drop the war like a snake. This war's for trade advantage. Oh, no, it's not. It's because we don't like kings. And won't have a king. And never will. And there we end. You draw out this tragedy further? As far as we must. But you've lost. Lost now. Your government's opposed. Your men in draglets. The dregs of what's swept up to We're we... all too well aware of that. We have lost. We know it. By all the rules of the game, we're beaten and should surrender. But the spirit of Earth moves over Earth like flame and finds new home when our old is burned out. It stands over this country in this dark year, stands like a pillar of fire to show us an uncouth clan, unread, harsh-spoken, but followers of a dream, a dream that men shall bear no burdens save of their own choosing, shall walk upright, masterless, doff their hats to none, and choose their gods. It's destined to win this dream, weak though we are, even if we should fail, it's destined to win. Sir, this is my last winter with the British Army here. They'll send someone else to fight you, but not me. I'm no Don Quixote to battle with dreams and windmills, but they'll press you harder when I'm gone home. Sir, we engage to stand it. No doubt you will. The terms I've offered you will not be offered by my successor. Sir, we should hardly expect it. No, for I've been too much your friend. But it's not over. Make up your minds to that. There was a storm promised before we came, and I'd like to escape it. We must go. Goodbye, sir. We wish you good morning, and a fair voyage, Sir William. Thank you. Oh, oh. I shall get a drubbing when I face England. And so we're left with some years of revolution on our hands. Maybe you shouldn't have put it up to us. I'm standing in a man's clothes for the first time in a year. I'd never say die. And we have food for three days. And for three more, if we can find it. And soon it will be spring, and I pledge you France will send help. Mason and Nick and Neil, attention. They paid for our three days. You know best who will pay for the days to come. We must bury them here. They died here and earned their ground. Shall we fire a volley over our dead? No, sir. We'll need our powder. And dead men don't hear volleys. So be it then. This liberty will look easy by and by when nobody dies to get it. This brings to a close our performance of Valley Forge by Maxwell Anderson. And this marks the last of this present series of great plays. Washington was played by William Johnston. Lafayette, Edward Trevor, Tench, Carl Benton Reed, Mary, Selina Royal, and General Howe by Eustace Wyatt. Valley Forge was adapted for radio and directed by James Church. Jack Costello speaking. This was an educational feature of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City.